Well, good afternoon and welcome everyone to today's Southern Fire Exchange webinar. My name is David Godwin and I'm the director of the Southern Fire Exchange program with the University of Florida. And I'm excited to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Mike Chamberlain with the University of Georgia. Over the next hour, Mike will discuss his work exploring the impacts of prescribed fire management programs on Eastern wild turkeys. We've seen quite a bit of interest in this topic from land managers, private landowners and hunters across the South. And I'm excited to have you all with us today. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Mike Chamberlain is the Terrell Professor of Wildlife Ecology and Management at the Warnell School of Forestry and Natural Resources at the University of Georgia. Mike completed his undergraduate education at Virginia Tech and both his MS and PhD degrees at Mississippi State. He then worked on the faculty at Louisiana State University for 11 years before moving to UGA in 2011. Mike has conducted research on wild turkeys for 25 years, and his recent research has focused extensively on wild turkeys and fire-managed pine forests of the Southeast. So welcome, Mike. I'm excited to have you with us here today. Thanks everybody who's joined us. And just one moment as we pull up his presentation. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with everyone today. Um, I was kind of glancing at the list of folks that were joining and some of you have seen some of this information recently, but I've, I noticed that there were quite a few names that, that, uh, that I did not know. So hopefully what I'm going to talk to you about will be of, of interest to you. Um, bottom line is this is, this is kind of a, uh, an ongoing, uh, set of studies, if you will, across the southeastern United States that has been funded by uh, Georgia Department of Natural Resources, Texas Parks and Wildlife, South Carolina DNR, and Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, along with some contributions from the National Wild Turkey Federation. Of course, um, I'm housed here at University of Georgia, so the Warnell School has been instrumental in, in getting some of this work done. So kind of the impetus for, for this work started back around uh, the late 2009-2010 time frame when I was still in Louisiana and it, it's kind of morphed into um, a set of studies uh, since then, kind of loosely framed originally around the notion that, that fire and how it's used in the southeast has, has evolved and become uh, more dynamic and, and different than it was historically. Uh, it's kind of this notion that we now have ignition methods that are different than they were historically. There's potential that that wildlife could be affected by different burning regimes, et cetera. And that kind of prompted uh, some work that started in 2011, which is what I'll go through today, kind of framed around the notion that let's evaluate how fire in pine dominated landscapes affects wild turkeys. And the bottom line is we've all seen pictures like these on the internet. Um, some of these I've posted myself and others uh, I've been asked to take a look at and comment on, you know, everything ranging from this uh, nest in the top left that, that was on a landscape managed with fire that ended up hatching to this figure on the the, the right side there with a with a nest that was clearly destroyed by the by the fire and then even images like in the bottom right where you have um, surviving poults that are inside of a nest that was within a stand that was clearly a, uh, influenced by fire so I get questions a lot about fire and how it influences turkeys and and so I kind of step back and and try to think about it big picture wise and depending on the sources that you use you, you recognize that most of the Southeast is really not managed with fire. Uh, in reality, the, and I put in quotes here, fire forest, but these would be forests that could be managed with fire, depending on the source and the year, you end up seeing that, that maybe six to 10% of these forests are treated annually. And we also know that most of these fires are dormant season fires, but that can be highly variable by site, by year, 
depending on weather conditions, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there ends up being a, a lot of variability across the landscape. And obviously that variability would and should influence a bird like a wild turkey. So one thing I wanna do is just very quickly explain why you would even care that, that fire would influence this bird. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about turkeys and, and how they use landscapes. Bottom line is this is the largest galliform we have in North America. So they are a mobile bird. They can cover a lot of ground. They require diverse habitats because they, their annual cycle dictates that they, uh, that they move from primarily hardwood dominated areas in the fall and winter into more upland habitats in the spring and summer um, as their reproductive cycle um, as the reproductive season, uh, excuse me, begins in late February, early March. And turkeys are not uniformly distributed across the landscape. They, they use an exploded lecking mating system. And, and what that means is if you, if you just took like a sage grouse lek and you blew it up, you would end up with little pockets of males on the landscape. Instead of one large lek, you'd end up with a with a bunch of smaller leks where you have one or two or three or four males, many of which are often related to each other that are displaying for females. And therefore you have pockets of turkeys. They're not distributed say as, as many other galliforms are. We also know that turkeys require early successional plant communities and they, they need these plant communities because one, they provide forage in the, in the form of, of green vegetation and insects but they also provide reproductive habitat um, through the kind of the, this notion of very dense understory in some places to more open understory in others so that they can then nest and then brood successfully. The other thing to consider with a turkey is they make a living by being able to see. So their, their primary means of survival is their eyesight. So they are adapted to being able to use that periscope head to see above vegetation, not to necessarily wade through it. It's also important to understand that it's tough to be a turkey. Uh, turkeys are, if you remember back from basic ecology, I know I'm resurrecting hellish memories for some, but they're, they're kind of this, this fence rider, if you will. They, they tend to exhibit R and K strategies. So in other words, they are relatively long lived for a bird but they have a high reproductive output. So you tend to see them kind of straddling this fence. And, and what that means for a manager is they're in this constant struggle to try to be reproductively successful and also live a long time. And that's, that's a difficult ecological strategy to, to try to use. They're ground nesters. They have a really long nesting season. Uh, we've found recently that about a, a fourth, if you will, of the year, they are in reproductive activities. And this figure shows you kind of nesting chronology from several sites in Georgia. And what you see is you have onset of incubation from late March all the way through uh, mid-July. So this bird tries uh, to be reproductively successful, but the problem is most nests fail. Uh, we're seeing about 20% success across the Southeast on an annual basis, which is not great. And we also know that most broods fail. So the, the nests that do hatch, most of those clutches end up being ultimately unsuccessful through loss of broods. So the question then becomes, well, how do we have any turkeys? And again, you go back to this is a long lived bird. They're supposed to be able to live a long time and be reproductively successful at some point in their lives. So talk a little bit about what we're doing and what I'm going to show you. This, this work started uh, back in 2011 with a, a, a study in South Georgia that was a VHF study that's just a classic you hang up a, a Jeep uh, I'm sorry a VHF unit on a bird and you track it around and you, you collect as much information as you could uh, it evolved in 2014 through the impetus of at the time Jimmy Stafford who was the turkey coordinator in Louisiana to become a GPS driven set of studies and it's evolved from there. We, we're now working on multiple study sites across the South. All these sites are pine dominated. Um, some are longleaf, some are loblolly and, and other species. They're all managed with prescribed fire and they're all publicly owned. 
whether it be US Forest Service lands or state wildlife management areas. And in general, they're managed on a one to four year return interval, one being very rare. We, we see very few stands that are managed on a one year rotation or, or interval on these sites. Most are in the two, three to four year uh, range. And we've known for years that fire could affect turkeys. Back from the days of Herbert Stoddard, there have been conversations amongst managers about how does fire affect this bird. I kind of think about it in these four bullets, if you will, that, that one, we could lose nest and broods to fire. Two, maybe birds would avoid burn stands or on the flip side, maybe they would actually select burn stands. Um, this third bullet would be, well, once the stand is burned, do we see that the bird changes their movement in response to the fire? Do they alter their behavior in response to fire? And then lastly, which is, is a really hot topic, no pun intended uh, now, is scale. So in other words, is the scale at which fires are applied commensurate with the bird uh, on the landscape? We, if you, if you kind of look in the literature, I'm not going to go into this because I don't really have time, but if you look in the literature, which we, we have done extensively, you basically see the following, that across most studies that have studied turkeys in fire managed landscapes, that a two to three year return interval is generally accepted to provide reproductive habitat with the longer towards the end of that saying two to three year, maybe a three, even a four year being nesting habitat and something in the two year range being brood habitat. Now obviously that, that's somewhat generalized, but the bottom line is most authors have likened that to, well, there's cover for nesting. There's the ability to get away from predators. Um, if you're a brood, you may even select a zero year or rough, meaning a stand that was burned this year because it provides this open vegetation community uh, that allows hens to be able to, to see, you know, danger approaching and then, and then move away. But the bottom line is, in general, that's typically what you see in the literature is a two to three year return interval is, is considered to be commensurate with turkey management. So kind of jump into to our data. So we've captured about 475 birds across the landscape in the past handful of years. And we've put GPS units on them. And we've documented 622 nests that were found on landscapes that were managed with fire. And of those 622, seven have been affected by fire. And what I mean by affected is they occurred in a stand that was managed with fire while the nest was on site. So in other words, the hen was incubating, the stand was burned. That equates to about 1% of all the nests on the landscape. And I'll, I noted here that that seven others would have been. And what that means is that there were seven other nests that were in stands that were scheduled to be burned, but predators depredated the nest prior to the fire event. So they would have been affected had, had the predators not found the nest. Oddly, two of those seven nests actually hatched, um, not complete hatches because some of the eggs around the outside of the clutch were, were damaged by the fire, but did hatch poults out of that that nest. Of 137 broods, we've only lost one to fire, and that was a brood that was on a site uh, that was on, in, within a stand the day after hatching uh, when a fire was applied in late May. The bottom line is what we're finding uniformly across sites is that most nests don't occur in stands that are scheduled to be burned. That in reality, if there's a consistent fire regime in place, these birds uh, end up nesting in one or two year roughs. And if they're in a three year rough, most of the time that stand ends up not being burned the year that the nest is in it. Uh, now we'll point out a few things that's important on this slide. One, most of the fires that are applied on the study sites we're working on are either dormant being January, February, early March, uh, or they're very early season uh, growing season fires, say mid to late March, early April. Now, that being said, we 
have had a number of birds exposed to fires later in the growing season. But if you look at all of the burns collectively, most tend to be dormant or early growing season fires. And I was talking with David before this, um, this webinar, and we were discussing this, this point here that the average scale of fires has ranged from about 50 acres on some of our sites to more than 1,200 acres on other sites. And that's, that's quite a range. And um, that's a good thing because I'm going to show you that uh, some of the later modeling work we've done, we parameterize those models using birds. And it was helpful to have birds that were exposed to a wide diversity of fires in regards to the scale of, of those events. So the bottom line is from a nesting and brooding standpoint, fire on the areas we've worked is not really a, a relevant source of loss. We've also looked at some, some cool behavioral data to see how birds respond immediately to fires. And this is kind of a synopsis of, of what we found about 80% of the birds that we've monitored have burns available to them. So in other words, when a burn was applied to the landscape, the bird was maintaining a home range that included that burn unit. And about 87% of those used a burn stand if it was available. Uh, so we then started teasing out by day, if you will, when do these birds resume using these stands? I will tell you, we've had instances of birds that stayed within the fire and never left the stand the day of the fire, but most do, most move out of the burn stand and then 14% used to stay in the same day of the burn. And then as you read those numbers, within two days, about almost 70% were using the stand again. And within a month, nearly all of the birds had resumed using the stand. So the bottom line is you tend to see this very quick behavioral response of birds moving back into these stands immediately after the fire event. This, this figure here, um, there seems like there's a lot going on, but there's not. So I'll kind of show you that basically the bottom line is this behavior right here is very typical of what we see with turkeys uh, immediately after fire. And this was a fairly large fire event. This was over 1600 acres you tend to see that birds uh, disproportionately use the edges of these stands. And this figure in the top right here is showing you that basically on the X axis, you see distance from edge and on the Y axis, you see this directional. And what that just means is birds that are walking. We, we go through the GPS data and we, we use a technique that teases out whether the bird is walking or, or using these long linear movements or whether they're hanging out and foraging or loafing. And I won't get into all of that. If somebody has questions, I can, I can answer them at the end. But the bottom line is you tend to see that as birds move away from edges, they tend to just walk through these stands. And that's, that's really what we see with the movement tracks as well. For whatever reason, it has stopped advancing, David. Let's see. Is it because the annotate tool is on? Can you go back to the cursor and then? Yeah, it's off. Advance through. There we go. There you go. All right, cool. Sorry about that, folks. Um, so. These figures actually show a very common response that, that we've seen across sites, particularly as the size of the fire uh, gets larger. And what you're seeing here is the figure in the top left was a bird's uh, daily locations. And these are about 14 locations, actually 15 if you include this roost site, which is the, the pink dot. And the yellow dots are these daily use locations once on the hour. So what you see in this figure is that several weeks before the fire, the bird uh, was using an area adjacent to the burn unit. The day of the fire, the bird was very close to the fire unit itself, ended up roosting inside of the unit that was burned. And then for several weeks afterwards, really concentrated her use around uh, the edge of this, this compartment. 
we see this very very commonly across sites, um, even with smaller, much smaller burn units. Um, and, and I'll get to some of the specifics of that, but this is a very common behavioral response that we see. We tend to see that these birds avoid the interior of stands after the fires, and that 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 effect becomes diminished through time, but it's noticeably uh, more prominent in in stands that are well over six, seven, eight hundred acres, uh, if you will, and it's it's not very common in, in stands that are 30, 40, 50 acres, meaning birds essentially use the entire unit. We also are seeing that, that juxtaposition to non-burn stands matters, and I'll lead you through what you're looking at kind of one at a time. So in the bottom left, you're, you're seeing the probability of a bird using the stand as distance to the to an unburned stand increases on the on the x-axis and what you see is you see this marked decline uh, in probability of use as you move farther away from unburned stands and this should make sense to most people I mean these birds are exploiting um, desiccated insects and other resources immediately after the fire but then then they're, they're exploiting succulent green vegetation that responds after the fire and they're also exploiting uh, insects that are recolonizing the stand from adjacent non-burned stands. So it makes sense that as you move farther and farther away from an unburned stand, they would be less likely to use it. What you're looking at on the right is basically the these linear movements again, and I'll kind of draw your attention to the bottom right. Uh, we, we quantified burn severity using DNBR values, um, and we combine that with ground truth data that we've collected on these sites to, to kind of validate the DNBR values, if you will. And what you generally see is that as severity increases within places in these stands, that these birds tend to just move through that. And I'll show you what it, that looks like um, a little bit later, but the bottom line is its severity seems to matter as well. We're also seeing that timing matters and what you're looking at in the top left is, is basically this logit effect on probability of use and just ignore that and just kind of pay attention to the trend here that you tend to see that these winter burns are not used until spring. Now part of that is common sense because again this bird during its annual cycle in the winter is generally not using pine stands. They're generally using hardwood or, or, or mixed stands that tend to have a strong hardwood component. So some of this quote unquote avoidance, if you will, early on is simply an artifact of their ecology. But then as you get uh, into the growing season, you'll see that uh, fires that are burned during the growing season, they tend to use them very, very quickly. And that, that again jives with our, our telemetry data. This figure in the bottom right essentially shows that same relationship. But what you'll note is that a March fire and a December fire relative to probability of use through time is essentially the same. And I think part of that is an artifact of March is when these birds are starting to enter their reproductive period and a fire applied during that period may cause a different behavioral response than one say in February that's prior to that event or in April or May that's after reproduction is either uh, in full swing or for many hens is actually ceased by that point. So I suspect that that relationship is kind of an artifact of, of the timing. So back to the fire intensity here. So the figure in the bottom left essentially just shows a, a comparable figure to what I just showed you previously, but the remainder of the figure shows you what it looks like kind of on the ground, if you will, where what you're seeing is uh, a schematic of DNBR values overlaid with an aerial photo of a, of a property in South Georgia, with the less severe areas being kind of these blues and, and very pale colors, and then the reds and the bright oranges being more uh, areas that had a more severe uh, fire uh, event. And what you typically see is exactly what these movement tracks are showing you. And just to kind of ignore the one, twos, and threes, those are, are essentially behavioral states that we put the bird into. But the bottom line is you see they, they kind of cluster these locations and areas uh, 
where the severity was was reduced relative to other areas and when the the severity was higher they tend to just move through those sites and, and that again is not particularly surprising giving uh, what these birds are looking for uh, on the landscape from a forage and resource uh, perspective. And that's all good. But then the question always comes back to scale. So when I've, I've shown these, these data to people, it, it very clearly to me demonstrates, one, we don't lose them a lot of nest to fire events. Sure, we all see the horror stories. Yes, it occurs, it happens, but relative to the big picture for this bird, it's not a relevant source of nest or brood loss. They don't avoid these stands. They will often recolonize these stands very quickly. Uh, again, this bird evolved in the presence of disturbance in the south, they're adapted to it. So you wrap all that together, and at least from a behavioral standpoint, those first three bullets that we, that we talked about when we, we had a, a picture of Herbert Stoddard earlier, we've kind of asked and answered those, but then we always come back to scale. And I get, I put this question here. Uh, this was a question that was sent to me through Facebook, uh, which is sometimes the devil. And that question was, well, how could a fire that consumed 2,000 acres in a day be, and this person wasn't as eloquent as being using this, this text, but this is me kind of summarizing it. And that's a question I get a lot. Um, and this is often geared primarily towards public federal, uh, federally managed lands, particularly uh, US Forest Service lands. So how do we answer this question? Uh, so what approach we took is, well, we recognize we can't study every bird. We can't study every fire. So what we're going to have to do is study as many birds and as many fires as we can. And then we're going to have to use a tool to try to help us understand what if, kind of play what if games. So what I'm going to do now is kind of lead you through some recent work we've done. We just completed this using the data I've just shown you to basically tell a model how, to, uh, how a turkey behaves. And what we've done is used what's called an individual based model. Uh, these have been around for a while. If you're the type that don't believe in models, then this is not for you. Um, but if you're the type that was like me as a child that got, uh, say, a, a model airplane for Christmas and the model was already put together and you couldn't take it apart and you couldn't figure out what was in it, well, that model sucked. But if you got a model plane for Christmas that you could take apart and that you could actually tinker with, uh, then you realize that that model was pretty close to reality. It looked just like the model plane, the, the real planes that you saw on television. So you tended to play with that model more. And, and I use that analogy because that's what we've done with this model. It's basically, these are just simulations that use behavior to predict something else. And again, since we can't study every fire, what we're going to have to do, at least our approach was, we're going to teach this model how a turkey behaves using turkey data. And then we're going to let the model run and, and explain to us how a bird would behave under varying scenarios. And I'll point out that our model's female-based because we were tracking hens on these sites. We, we do have some data on, on toms, but it's not included in, in this work. At some point we will include it, but, but for now this is only on hens. So what we did is we took the landscape and we essentially created it and starting the top left, we, we considered a patch to be 15 meters. So every patch on the landscape is a 15 meter square. And then we just stuck a bunch of these patches together. Basically what the model does is it, it um, pastes all these patches together into a series of repetitive patches. And those become burn units. And those patches are going to vary in size. We're going to have the model essentially vary the landscape from a fire perspective, but we're going to truncate the landscape at 50,000 acres. So in other words, we're going to say it's 50,000 acres. We're going to have turkeys living in this landscape. We're going to have 17 landscapes per shape. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean by shape. And then we're going to allow the only thing to vary being how large the fire is that's applied to the landscape. We're starting out very small and going quite large. 
we know that shape should matter, right? So we assume that scale interacts with shape. So you would think, given what I've already shown you, that a square burn would be different, differentially used than a rectangular burn or an oblong type burn. So basically what we did is we made landscapes that were more simplified or square, and then we made landscapes that were more rectangular. Now, I will say we've, we've tried other scenarios as well, ones that were oblong, that don't have corners, uh, or the corners or void spaces, and they end up essentially mimicking the rectangular uh, landscape. So I'm just going to show you these two for simplicity, but the bottom line is we, we have these two landscapes and, and then we, we turn this model loose. Here's the scenarios and, and kind of what they look like. So example one would be the smallest spatial scale, which would be 57 acres. Now, some of you may be asking, which I did as well at the beginning, why, why 57 acres? Why not 55 or 50 or 60? This is, uh, this is an artifact of those pixels, if you will. So remember each one of these patches is a series of pixels like a picture. So these acreages that you're going to see as I go through this exercise are kind of an artifact of those, those pixels, if you will. So in this example, the area burned is 12,500 acres. And I'll point out what we did is we assumed that the landscape, the entire landscape is managed with fire. Now we know that's not, that's not reality. We know that no landscape is managed entirely with fire. There are areas that aren't burned. But for our, our goal here was to see all things being equal, how does a bird respond to a fire? Moreover, we're interested in the fire that's applied this year. So these red squares that you see on this landscape, these are current year burns. The other colors of green that you're seeing are burns that were applied one year prior, two years prior, or three years prior. So the bird only has four possible scenarios. They can only use four different types of stands. They don't have hardwood available to them or anything else. These are only burn stands. So in this example, you'll see there are a lot of burn units um, and there are a lot of units that are burned, right? Because they're smaller. And I've gotten this question before. If you, if you note, they're kind of distributed um, like a checkerboard pattern. Now you, you can distribute them any way you want. But we chose this pattern because one, we didn't want to hand pick where we put these fires because we were afraid that we would essentially bias the model through our own lack of objectivity. So in other words, we would say, well, in reality, burn managers cluster these or, or and so we would start clustering them and then we would bias uh, the model run. So we let the model uh, distribute the, the burn units in this way. We've actually tried more random distributions. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to, to really matter, but I'll point out that we we'll essentially let the model select how these were distributed. The next example, you get a little bigger. So in this example, you've got 500 acre burns. The same amount of the landscape is burned each year. You have much fewer burn units and you have much fewer units that are burned, but obviously they're much larger. And then you get this, this very extreme example, which would be a, a 3,000 plus acre burn. Uh, again, the, the same amount of the area is burned, but you only have a few units. Now, I put this kind of tongue in cheek, but in many social media outlets, this is what all fires are. And we recognize that's not the case, but there is a perception amongst many constituents that all fires are 3,000 acres plus, but I put this somewhat jokingly, but we tried to, to set this model up where it would start at a very small scale and then proceed to a very large scale uh, and therefore would encompass uh, all of the spatial scales that would be used on various stands on various properties. And I'll, I'll show you what we found. So this looks like a mess, but it's not really. Um, so what we did is we put these turkeys in non-burn stands. So in other words, the, the top left figure, you'll see that all of these turkeys are in stands that were not burned that year. And we applied all of these fires at the same time. And the reason we did that is twofold. One, we assumed the bird wouldn't stay in the stand that was burned that day. 
right? Even though we know that a few have, we assume that they would all move out of the burn unit. So we put them outside of the burn unit, applied the fire all at the same time, and then evaluated how the birds responded to the fire as the scale increased. So we stuck 40 birds, you can use any number you want, but we stuck 40 essentially uh, um, alien birds, if you will, and I'll show you how we, we told the model how to behave. But, and then we let, the, we let turkeys or these pseudo turkeys be turkeys. And what you're seeing on the right, the larger figure, is the predicted movement tracks of these birds through space. And as an aside, that's exactly what GPS tracks look like. When we connect the dots, if you will, for these 15 daily locations, they look just like bowls of spaghetti, just like that. So if you just glance at the model, it tends to show you that these birds are quote unquote behaving like a turkey. Let me lead you through this. So in the bottom right, in the bottom left, if you will, you'll see two quotes that I have had on my mind for many years. The one in the bottom right says that in some cases we can actually just accept models and allow them to supplant reality. So in other words, we know that no model is perfect. And in some cases, our minds just gravitate towards just allowing them to supplant reality, which is a dangerous exercise. And in the bottom left, you'll see a quote that is near and dear to me because it says that everything we do is really primitive, yet it's the most precious thing that we have as scientists. We know that we're generalizing and, and trying to mimic reality when in reality, all of our generalizations are primitive and childlike, yet it's the best, most comprehensive approach we can take. So what I'm going to show you in, the, in this white box, if you will, is kind of what this model ran on. It ran on 14 movements a day for a year. And based on how the bird moved, the model moved the bird a certain distance. So in other words, if the bird was walking, it was walking at the, the average rate that our birds walk on the landscape. And when it decided to turn and walk in a different area or move on the landscape, it did so using a turning angle or a change in direction commensurate with what our birds, our real birds use. We did the same thing for, for other behaviors. And we used 153 hens to parameterize or teach this model. And what we did is we chose the, the hens that had a, a fire managed stand a, directly adjacent to them on the day they were being monitored. So these were birds, these were 153 birds that were most affected by fire events on our different study sites. This is kind of what I thought we would see. Um, my hypothesis is in the red line. And my hypothesis was that this Y axis being turkey use and this X being the scale, that as scale increased, you would see that turkeys would kind of just do the same thing. And then all of a sudden there would be this kind of slow decline through time that would accelerate as scale got to a certain point. And that would be commensurate with their kind of their home range sizes. So in other words, you could burn a lot of their range and it wouldn't matter. And then at some point you'd get to this breaking point, if you will, this inflection point and boom, it would go down and the rate of, of turkey use would almost be an, kind of like an exponential growth curve in reverse, if, if that makes sense. Well, that's not exactly what, what we observed. So there's a lot on this slide, so I'll, I'm gonna lead you through it. So what you're looking at in this figure in the, on the y-axis is the percent use of these stands. And on the x-axis, you're looking at scales and acres starting at that 57 acre going all the way up to that over 3,000 acre. The two colored bars you're seeing are on the left, the dark gray is a rectangular burn, and in the light gray, you're looking at a square burn. So you see that there is, tends to be a greater use of rectangular burns than square burns, but it's not as dramatic as I thought it would be. The other thing you'll notice is there are, there are error bars on these, the, in this figure. 
but they're so small. And it's because this model ran so many times and there were so many data points for each bird per day across a year that the variation is essentially almost zero. The predicted variation in behavior is, is literally almost zero. I'll, I'll point to a couple of things. So the blue line that I've put there from the 57 acre mark to around 400 ish somewhere in there, you tend to see that there's about a 50% reduction in use. That red star is pointing to 500 acres. And remember, these birds had four different habitats available to them. So you would think by random chance alone that the probability of use would be 25%. And that 500 acres is about where you see 25% being used. So the take home to me there is that unlike my prediction, you tend to see that the probability of use declines fairly consistently right out of the box as spatial scale increases. And by the time you get to this 500 acre mark, give or take, you're essentially producing a stand that has the same probability of use as a stand burned either last year or two or three years prior. The other thing I would point you to is what's in this red box. These pre-nesting and laying, that's two seasons that we've delineated for our marked birds. And what that would be, would be pre-nesting would be the period from the time we catch them in the winter until they start laying, usually late March, early and mid April. And then their laying period would just be that couple of weeks during which they're actively laying in, in a nest somewhere. They're, they're not moving as freely as they were during pre-nesting because they are tied to that nest site, but they're still moving about the landscape. To the right of that, you see core area sizes, which would be these areas of, of their concentrated use, kind of their, their, their backyard, if you will. And then you'd see their home range sizes. Now these are averages that I've pulled from all of our, our marked birds. And what you see is that during pre-nesting, they have almost a thousand acre home range. And that makes sense. These birds are coming out of their winter flocks. They're moving a lot. They're kind of settling their scores. Their dominance hierarchies are still in place. And they're kind of moving about trying to figure out where they're going to become reproductively active. And then once they start laying, their home ranges decline by half and their core areas are, are quite small. Just for perspective, uh, a 50 acre fire using these home range and, and core area sizes would consume anywhere from about 36 to, to well over 60% of their core area depending on when the fire was applied. And a 500 acre fire would consume half to more than their entire home range, again, depending on the timing. So to me, it, it speaks volumes why this figure shows what it shows, that these, these predicted probability of, of use metrics are really commensurate with the bird's range use, if you will. So kind of the take home from a scale perspective is we know that turkeys maintain home ranges and we know from other works, they don't leave those home ranges. So we have studied turkeys uh, exposed to catastrophic flooding. They don't leave their ranges, they'll die inside of their range. We've studied turkeys that were exposed to catastrophic wildfires in Texas. They didn't leave their home ranges. They moved away from the fire and immediately came back. So we know that regardless of stress or disturbance, this bird is restricted to a home range and they're going to deal with it for better or for worse. We also know from just basic ecology that everything has a scale. Everything has an allometric scale, meaning their legs are so long, they can only move so far, they can only move so fast, and that's constrained by energetic requirements and size. So you put this bird in a range, you manage it, and then it deals with it, the management hand it's dealt, if you will, and uses space recognizing that it's scaled that it can only do so much uh, in such a short period of time. So if you, if you kind of look at the results under that, that window, if you will, it makes kind of, 
common sense really that the basics of their range use kind of support the model results, which then begs the question to me, well, is there a sweet spot for fires? And I, I get this question a lot. And I think the answer is, is no. And I, I say that because we all know that every fire is different. We know that all sorts of things influence fire behavior. Uh, some things we can control and many we can't. So I suspect that there's no such thing as a sweet spot, that, that each fire is, is different. But from the standpoint of scale, uh, the sweet spots, if you will, appear to range somewhere between the very low end of our spectrum, which is 50-ish acres, uh, not to exceed somewhere in that, that 500 acre range. The more important thing to me as a scientist is the indirect effects of fire. And we really have absolutely no clue whatsoever, which is a line of research that, that I'm, I'm moving down now, which is, okay, so these birds that are affected by fire or, or have stands that they're using that are managed with fire, what are the ecological consequences to the bird? Does it change their survival? Does it change their reproductive fitness through life? These are really difficult questions, but technology is getting to the point where, where we should be able to start getting answers to that. I'll point you to this figure in the bottom left. If you, this was a bird uh, on Kasachi National Forest in Louisiana. And if you, if you look, the different colors are fires applied in different years. And you'll see that this bird, pretty much most of her range was, a, was, was managed uh, through fire. The X's denote stands that if you use our model results, probably should not have been burned in the year in which they were burned because collectively those compartments and burn units exceeded the size of what the model suggests would be more commensurate with the bird. So, I would recommend managers kind of think about that as you go about planning prescriptions, uh, recognizing that from a, a bird's perspective that maintains a range, two fires that are adjacent to each other, essentially, if they're, if they're managed with fire in a very short temporal window, that's essentially one fire unit from a, from a turkey's perspective. So I would, I would kind of close with, with this. I mean, we know this bird is linked to fire. We know that historically they were inextricably linked to disturbance in the pine forest of the South. We know that those fires uh, were ignited from varying sources, but turkeys have been prominent in these landscapes historically, and they, they still are an important component of these landscapes. The big but is, um, from the standpoint of scale, everything else suggests that nest loss is not a big issue if the regimes are consistent. The birds don't avoid these stands. In fact, they readily use them after fire. They tend to avoid the interior of larger fires, uh, but as the scale becomes larger and larger relative to their range size, the prediction would be that, that those fires are not commensurate with the ecology of the bird. And that's pretty much what I have. Um, I have some other information I can show if necessary, if, if questions dictate, uh, but I didn't, I didn't want to go over my allotted time. So with that, David, I'd, I would be happy to answer questions. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mike. If you all joined us during the presentation, uh, my name is David Godwin, and I'm the director of the Southern Fire Exchange with the University of Florida, and we just had a a fascinating presentation on the fire ecology of eastern wild turkeys with Dr. Mike Chamberlain from the University of Georgia. We still have quite a few folks on the line today, I can tell, and we do have time uh, left uh, to address questions. So I would encourage you to please put your questions in the Q&A window uh, in Zoom, and then uh, I'll be able to read those aloud so everybody can hear the question and, and Mike can um, address them. Um, he's going to leave his slides up there right now so that he can refer to a specific slide uh, as needed to, to be able to get to your question. So I see some folks are already starting to type some things in, and, and as those questions come on, uh, we will work to address them. So we already have one came in, Mike, uh, from Teresa. Uh, 
And uh, Teresa says, does the method of ignition matter? And I know we've heard this in other places as well. And, and Teresa says, helicopter versus uh, hand ignition. Uh, could you speak to that? Yeah, so from the standpoint of, of our birds and their behavior, um, we have been unable to see any link between a, a fire that was ignited with a drip torch versus a helicopter in regards to birds remaining outside of the fire, not using the, the stand after the burn. Uh, in fact, uh, a number of the, the nests that were affected by fire that I pointed out, although there were very few, a number of those nests were in stands that were ignited with drip torches. So the, the short answer would be no. The more complicated answer uh, is I think it depends on a number of, of, of items, which David, you and I talked about a little bit beforehand, whether the presence of fire shadows or riparian areas or, or, or things that would cause natural breaks and fires that were ignited, uh, say using helicopter ignition, would certainly factor into how birds respond to it. But based simply on the data that we have thus far, we don't see a we don't see a difference. So this here's a question that just came in from Michael, and this ties into some of the kind of things that that you uh, mentioned today, and and you and I talked about earlier. Michael says, has has anyone looked at burn severity and completeness versus uh, just burn and no burn differences? He says we tend to do some larger patchy burns which achieve mosaic patterns. Uh, when they burn it in uh, Manatee County? Yeah, the, the severity question, yes, but but only from the standpoint of of the DMBR values that we showed. That that's and that's how we've quantified severity uh, relative to bird use of the stands after fire. And and I, I I didn't point this out, but basically what we did is we used a really narrow window of time. Uh, in regards to when the imagery was shot after the fire so that we could kind of nail down severity relative to plant succession after the fire. So in other words, we didn't want stands to be, you know, three or four months after the fire and be using imagery shot on those stands to try to quantify severity. So what we do know about severity is it matters. Yes, the, the areas that are more severely influenced by fire uh, greater scorching, uh, more homogeneous vegetation, or or kind of a somewhat retarded plant response afterwards. Those areas, turkeys, if they use them, they're just walking through them. I thought it was interesting to see that you used burn severity in DNBR. I did my master's work uh, with mapping burn severity in, in Central Florida in some scrub in the Ocala National Forest, and it's not a tool that I see used very often in the Southeast um, outside of just mapping and even mapping is limited. So I, it's a, certainly an interesting application. Yeah, we, um, well, we, we have a colleague here at UGA that was using concurrently with us doing these analyses. He was using ground truth data from uh, stands that we had visited or that he and others had visited and he was doing vegetation sampling within those stands so that he could validate the DMBR metrics relative to what was on the ground. Mm -hmm. And he hasn't published that yet, but from what I've seen, it, it is super cool stuff. And it basically shows that uh, at least early on, those values do a pretty good job at depicting what's there when you ground truth the stand. It's pretty interesting stuff. All right, here's a question that just came in from Chuck. And Chuck says, if a nest is burned over, does the hen typically abandon immediately or will she attempt to sit on it, thus being more subject to predation? That's a really interesting question. We, we've seen both responses. We've seen some hens that, that just leave and abandon the nest. And then of course, you know, it fails. We've also had some, some interesting examples of hens that return to the nest and resume incubating. And in some cases they do so, let's one example I can, I can think of off the top of my head was in a fire shadow within a stand. Uh, 
and she went back to the nest. She was sitting there almost in the wide open, but just had enough cover that she, she made it work and she ended up hatching. We've also had hens that returned to a nest that was completely, all of the vegetation around the nest was completely uh, removed um, from the fire and they go right back and resume incubation. And you would think superficially that that would be terrible because they are in the wide open. But what we've seen from a predator standpoint, uh, coyote data that, that I've worked on, raccoon data that I've, I've worked on in a previous life, those animals almost immediately move away from, from recent fires. They don't use those fires. So you take a raccoon and, and he or she climbs out of its tree today and the stand that they were using to forage in is gone. It's been, it's been altered from a fire, they move. Uh, that day. Coyotes do the same thing. So from a predation standpoint, it's not really as cut and dry as you would think it is, which is interesting to me that that these birds have a strong fidelity to that nest. And in some cases, they can still make it work even after the fire event. Here's a related question that came in and says, from your research, was hen reproductive fitness different from burned and unburned sites? And likewise, did you get poult success data? So if so, similar question on differences between burned and unburned tracks. Well, no, because all of the areas that we're working on now are managed with fire. If, you're, if the question is more geared to hens that did not have fire events in their home range, we had very few of those. I think if you go back or think back to the one slide, it was more than 80% of the birds that we have monitored on these sites had a fire in their home range while we were monitoring them. And so very few of our birds have been not exposed to a fire event. Um, I will say that we, we have some work that's being initiated this coming year on some parts of the landscape in the South that have very, very little use of fire. I'll be curious to see uh, how those data turn out. Mm -hmm. The poll question is, is, is one I, I can't really answer because um, there's, there's two schools of thought in regards to monitoring polls. There's one, and, I, and, I've, and I have a strong opinion about one. One is to actually go in and capture polls um, and mark them individually. And, and that's a, to me, is a pretty heavy handed approach and would require extraordinary coordination to be able to see how a fire event affected a brood that, that's mobile like that. So in other words, we would, we would have to go in and mark broods that were really young and then hope that they were influenced by a fire. So what we do is we look at brood survival. In other words, we don't worry about the poults. We, we walk in on the hens while they're brooding every few days and we determine whether she has, does she have one or more? Yes, the brood's still intact. Does she have zero? No, the brood's dead. So from the standpoint of, of the brood data I've sh I showed you, the bottom line is the, the only brood we know was lost was a, was a brood that she was in the stand, the brood was very young and she lost the entire brood inside of that fire event of that day, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Here's a question that came in from Jeff. And uh, Jeff says, as a, as a forestry consultant, the information on predator use after a fire is very interesting. Is that information readily available for sharing with clients who might think otherwise? So perhaps is there a citation or some a collection of publications you might be able to point us toward? Towards. Yes. Yes. You. Um, n not particularly recent, though. The the work that I was involved with that looked at how raccoons responded to fire was back from the 90s. Um, if if anyone wants to contact me, I can provide PDFs of those documents, the manuscripts that, that came out of that work. The the coyote data, that's more just kind of anecdotal. We we haven't. We, we've got GPS data on about 230 coyotes at this point during the past four years. And we've, we've never looked at coyote behavior relative to fire per se in a kind of an analytical framework. But if you just look at their, their points on a, on a map, 
as fires occur, they don't use these fire events. And at least initially, there was some work down from the Jones Center that was a part of Mike Cherry's dissertation work. I could, I could obviously get my hands on that and provide it to someone that was interested, looking at how coyotes responded kind of in, and used a fire managed landscape. Now, granted, that was a longleaf site, so it's a little different than many other sites, but collectively those would give you an idea of, of kind of how these animals are responding. So we had a question that came in from Keith and Keith is asking, uh, have you correlated the edge of a fire unit used to see if you could reduce unit size to avoid having large interior areas that aren't used? And um, that kind of ties into a question I had is looking at your model and, and it seemed like there was the preference for those rectangular shaped um, pixels. Right. You blocks, I suppose. Um, do you think that there are opportunities to address those edge questions with different sized or irregular um, or multi-sided um, blocks in future modeling efforts? Yeah, I, I do. I, I think the, these models are, as you can imagine, these models take, require an extraordinary amount of computing power and the, the options are essentially limitless, but what they are bounded by, again, is they can't perfectly mimic reality. So we couldn't per se create more of a stand that looked like an amoeba or something like that. But what we could do is go in and as you increase the scale of fires, um, if you put for instance, uh, fire breaks or created linear features in the model that, for instance, if the fire was a thousand acres and you made it to 500 acre fires, that then would have some associated edge effect with them because of the break between them. We could, we could create those scenarios. I think the model as it currently runs already accounts for a lot of that because as the bird moves away from the edge of a stand, once she got, now these are, again, the imaginary hens, but once they get away, a certain distance away from the edge, they either stop or they turn and move either parallel with themselves or back where they came from, which is what our, our GPS mark birds do or did. So I think the model already accounts for some of that, but we can, we, and we will, we, we will certainly be seeking ways to make it more complicated, if you will, and create different scenarios where we can see, can you tweak the scale by tweaking other part, you know, other attributes of the landscape, if you will. There's a question that came in and it's kind of getting down, uh, I hate to say down in the weeds, but really down to the ground. And uh, the person asked if, if they're out burning and they find a, a nest with eggs, uh, what's your suggestion? What should they do? Leave it alone. Um, if, if, and I, I hate to sound cliche, but this is like the argument, you know, if you find a fawn, what do you do with it? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just leave it alone. If, if the nest is intact, there's a pretty good shot. She's coming back to check on it. And again, we've seen, scenarios where they make it work so you know I, I would just let it be and and if it fails it fails and if it succeeds it succeeds but the the one thing you do know is if you remove it from the landscape there's no possibility of it succeeding because even if you hatch it on your own you've done nothing to produce a bird that's is going to suffer mortality at some point so i would just leave leave it be mm -hmm. i would We'll wrap things up with kind of a, a combination of two questions that, that have come in. And I think they get to the big picture that a lot of folks have questions of. And it's, it's, it says, do you, do you see prescribed fires having the ability to control or reduce turkey populations? And I, that's a combination of a question I, from Randy and Jay. Sure. The short answer is yes. If I, th I think it's common sense, if you, if you think through how this bird functions on the landscape, 
and how they're distributed, which is kind of why I wanted to go through that. It, it's common sense to think that it, at some scale and depending on timing, which is kind of the fly in the ointment here at, at some points, that yes, you, you, you could use fire in a way that doesn't benefit the bird, but is more of a detriment to the bird. And I would think that scenario would, would come when you end up with very large scale fires that are placed more uniformly across the landscape, um, particularly during the reproductive period. Those, those types of events would not, would not be positive for the bird. All right, I think we'll, we'll wrap things up at that. Uh, appreciate everybody for joining us today. It looks like we've run up a little bit over uh, our time allotment today. I'd like to thank you, uh, Michael, for joining us, for your presentation, for sharing uh, an amazing amount of research effort from many years uh, pulled together into one really comprehensive uh, presentation today. Sure, glad to do it. We have.